inequality is really, systemically speaking, the leading cause of death on this planet. So what is the solution? How do we transition out of this ongoing public health crisis known effectively as inequality driven by market economics and capitalism? This is a figure from the fifth chapter of the book presenting five economic transitions. Automation, access, open source, localization, and networked digital feedback. I'll appreciate patience as I go through these because it's going to be a little tedious. Each one of these represents a more efficient mechanism to achieve higher productivity, reduced inequality, and have the least amount of waste and environmental impact. If any of these changes were actually applied, you would see a relative general public health improvement and ecological improvement systemically. Interestingly, these five ideas are not obscure. They're not randomly idealized or pie in the sky. They're not pulled out of thin air. Anyone who's paid attention to current social and technological trends are aware of them, but likely haven't thought about their broader implications in terms of public health. I'll go through each one briefly. Automation. As we've already touched upon, this is perhaps the most obvious need in terms of the immediate need, I should say, as human employment is now inverse to productivity in the sectors where applied. It is not just a structural need to detach labor from income, it is also a social imperative. Given how integral it has been in generating this new level of efficient abundance, not to mention freeing the human being from drudgery and oppression, remember the greatest form of social oppression in human history has been the exploitation of labor, from slavery to feudalism to colonialism to capitalism. The battle between owners and workers, unions and companies, this would finally come to an end. Access. The second attribute noted refers to access versus property, by which I mean tilting the balance toward access and away from this ownership phenomenon. Ownership and property, of course, you know, are foundational to the market economy. And the idea goes back to folks like John Locke many, many centuries ago. However, things have changed once again, and our high technology society is now being hindered by the tradition of ownership, proving it to be wasteful and now impractical. From the standpoint of efficiency, the idea of everyone owning one of everything, as the market would like to assume, is irrational. For a species sharing a finite planet, not to mention completely and utterly unnecessary, it also promulgates a materialist conception of life, of course, which is really quite destructive to our social psychology. Perhaps the best example today of this is the slow inevitability that we see of shared automated car systems. It isn't difficult to see that even in our current system, how the idea of owning a car in the future might become impractical. One would simply call upon the car through an app or so on when needed in much the same way you see with things like Uber. It would be efficient enough and automated to the effect that it would be, again, impractical to sit and house a car. In 2015, there were 258 million consumer vehicles in the United States. Yet the average use time is only 5%, meaning that, in pure abstract theory, only 14 million cars would be needed to meet demand versus 258 million. Again, this is another level of the phenomenon of ephemeralization, more with less, on a structural level. And this kind of strategic access can be applied to many other use needs in our lives without the baggage of ownership, improving sustainability, while also increasing access abundance. It also improve our psychology once again. Third issue, open source. The full incorporation of open source contribution, making all industrial and scientific information, scientific information freely available, could be deemed the cultivation of a collaborative commons. While we are taught that intellectual property is a driver of competitive innovation in the market, it doesn't hold a candle to the power of the group mind and the wisdom of crowds. It is the sharing of technological information in the long run that really creates our industrial technical process, not the hoarding of it. And if such a system of contribution was created properly, if we could create a technical means to engage not only design but the virtual testing, CAD and such systems, other advanced methods of prototyping in the virtual space, it could lead to a point where corporations really don't need to exist at all because it's networked, the relevance of corporate identity, the, the structure itself becomes obsolete when you can 
embrace the entire society for collective creative development. You simply connect the design systems to what will be increasingly, again, increasingly smaller industrial production complexes in the sense that we are seeing today with things like additive manufacturing and 3D printing. Hence, again, ephemeralization applied to industry as a whole. And again, I apologize to move so quickly through this because it's a very interesting and nuanced subject, but due to time, I have to be general here. However, what this approach can enable is something really the world has never seen, a true participatory economy, which, by the way, really, really can only precede a true social democracy. The fourth issue is localization. Building upon this trend of ephemeralization, it is a natural progression to now relocalize industries. In stark contrast to globalization, localization is about regaining efficiency and reducing waste by locally producing as much as possible, streamlining the supply chain. Extraction, production, distribution, and recycling should be subject to design itself on the, on the highest level, organized in the closest proximity to the population in need. Today, the average American food plate travels about 2,000 miles before you eat it. That's a preposterous given the technological potentials we have now with numerous urban systems, vertical farming, modular, multi-purpose additive manufacturing. Again, we have the technology to now minimize the industrial process as a whole, not to mention bring back a community ethic that globalization is actually buried. And this also means decentralization, which has, of course, many positive features. Oceanic circles is why Gandhi used to refer to it because he was opposed to industrial globalization way back then on the premise that you have to have communities that have a local sense and extend out from there. And he envisioned societies of oceanic circles that layer across the world as opposed to centralized capitalist systems, which is pretty much what this phenomenon uh, that we have possibility of now can do. And the final transition is digitized network feedback. A Primitive form of this, so to speak, is now referred to as the Internet of Things, which I'm sure many have heard. And it's about networking technology and sensors to optimize information flows rather than just rely on price. Today's economy is mostly driven by feedback from consumer purchases. People buy, business records this over the transaction, and production alters its designs and distribution to accommodate based on that feedback. It's a term uh, that someone named Ludwig von Mises coined years ago in opposition to anything of central planning and so on called the price mechanism. In the 20th century, price is now a very, very weak economic measure. In contrast, mechanisms related to this kind of so-called Internet of Things, the ability to connect everything and understand mass amounts of complicated information in a systems approach, obviously would be calculated by computers. We can monitor extremely efficiently consumer preference, demand, supply, planetary resources, labor value in terms of how difficult certain means are. And we can do this virtually in real time if a system was prepared. Everything is connected digitally so we know what we have and what we're doing. Imagine that. Much of this information, by the way, is pretty much non-existent today because corporations have proprietary restrictions on the information they have. We really don't know anything about the hydrocarbon state of this planet, for example. We really don't know how many particular ores or how many diamonds or anything because it's their privilege to hoard this information, release it more at their competitive advantage than to actually be truthful. But the real power of all this comes when you combine all the other things I've listed in this figure, automation, access, open source, and localization. You combine them into one synergy, one system. In other words, when people engage in open source, collaborative commons network, working design, with each other, utilizing the group mind. That information can be linked to all of the networked feedback that we're getting from the sensors and the information in our environment. It's hard for me to explain that, but if you can imagine designing something where you have to ask the question, do we have an amount of this enough to, to work in this system, to work in this product, that answer could be readily available through this type of interactive feedback system. Immediate state of resources, trends, possible scarcity, public use patterns, and so on. This is the fabric of a real economy, actually organizing and understanding what you're doing. And again, it's a large subject as extensively detailed in the book, so I'm going to have to kind of leave it at that. In conclusion, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights states in Article 25, everyone has the right to a standard of living 
adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, and other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. It's very easy for institutions like this to give lip service to how things are supposed to be in the hope for really what is a more egalitarian view of society with social justice. And as fundamental as this is, the truth is the economic basis of our society today completely works against the hope of any of that occurring. And if the trends stay the same, it's just going to get that much more distant to find balance and justice on the level of public health as time moves forward. I'm going to leave you with this, this disturbing chart which annotates seven negative trends, which in synergy by about 2050 will likely foment a new paradigm of social destabilization if the structure of our society, meaning of course the structure of our economy, does not change dramatically. And such changes, again, are no longer an issue of ideology. This isn't an argument towards what's good or bad or right or wrong, I should say. This isn't this isn't uh, freeing people from something. This isn't a Marxist perspective. This is an issue of public health and what is required to keep society with some form of stability as we approach 9 billion people by 2050. And that ultimately is the new human rights movement, a movement to change the structure of our society, improve our well-being before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. Take your life, man.